guys, Kelly Fremont. I'm chair of the Physics and Earth Science Department here at Moravian College. So, we have a Moravian College and the Central Pennsylvania section of the American Association of Physics Teachers in our spring meeting uh, this year. I'd like to welcome you to our uh, keynote address. Um, this will be uh, done by uh, Dr. Terry Hart, uh, standing here. Uh, Dr. Hart uh, graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Lehigh University. Uh, received master's degrees uh, from mechanical engineering from MIT and electrical engineering from Rutgers and received a doctorate from Lehigh University. Uh, he is a former NASA astronaut, pilot, and successful telecommunications executive uh, who's been with Lehigh's faculty since 2004. He was aboard STS 41C Challenger, NASA's 11th space shuttle mission, uh, launched in uh, 1984. Uh, he is also the holder of two patents for work in noise suppression circuitry. Uh, so without further ado, uh, please welcome Dr. Terry Hart. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kelly. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. wonderful. So, uh, so I told my wife, uh, I'm so excited about tonight because I get to spend Friday night in a room full of physicists. <laughs> and I can't think of anything more fun to do than that. And I've got some really rather serious about that. I spent most of my career sort of in the uh, the intersection between mechanical engineering and physics. I do orbital mechanics and things like that. I teach control systems and some more engineering oriented stuff, but I've always liked that intersection. And I'm, I'm pleased to, at Lehigh, I occasionally get a, uh, a good student from the physics department that wants to do orbital mechanics kind of things. Uh, uh, most recently, actually, it was a PhD that, that Kelly uh, knows well. Uh, it was a student here, a uh, physics major at uh, Moravian came to Lehigh then to do a master's, stay for his PhD in orbital mechanics with me. So he kind of went to the dark side there in mechanical engineering. Uh, but he, he's working for the government now, doing stuff he can't tell me about. But uh, for my young man, his uh, background in physics, of course. Um, and I'll also think of my first um, exposure to physics was in high school. I, I was fortunate enough to grow up in uh, the South Hills of Pittsburgh, and I went to one of the finest uh, high schools state here, Mount Lebanon High School, and I had a physics teacher, and uh, you teach uh, high school physics as uh, usually a senior subject, right, senior, so my senior year, Mr. Zacker, and Mr. Zacker was a wonderful guy, and I just thoroughly fell in love with uh, physics at that time, not so much chemistry to hear before, but, <laughs> you know, but uh, uh, and then I had the privilege, I didn't see him then for many years, and I went off uh, in the Air Force and then NASA, and then right after my mission in the uh, shuttle, uh, got a chance to come back and do an assembly at my high school. Mr. Zachler was still there teaching, and I had the, the chance to go back and shake his hand and thank him for getting me launched on the proper trajectory there for a, a career in, uh, in science. So, uh, so I have a lot of regard for what uh, you folks do. Let me uh, tell you a little bit about what I do uh, at Lehigh these days. I you know, teach aerospace engineering. Uh, in the same department I graduated, mechanical engineering, we do a a minor in aerospace engineering, so I focus on those uh, electives in air, aircraft design and spacecraft design, that kind of stuff. Uh, so the introductory course I give to juniors that are taking that minor, uh, I, the first lecture I use these charts I'm going to show you tonight, uh, and it's 100 years of aerospace engineering. So I'm going to go through a whole bunch of pictures here, here real fast in about 30 minutes or so, and then we'll have time for, for Q&A. I'll be glad to try to answer your question. Hear what your thoughts are you know, on where the space program is, particularly, in, uh, and uh, you know, where NASA's going. Uh, but this first uh, chart is actually a, a mural. It used to hang at down in the Smithsonian. They don't have it there anymore. But it's uh, uh, 100 years of uh, aerospace engineering from the Wright brothers uh, back in that uh, 1903 or whatever they got launched there uh, up to the space station today uh, and all the things that have happened in that 110 or 12 years later, and uh, all the lessons learned uh, from engineering and, and science during that time. So he yeah, started with Orville, Orville and Wilbur. So Orville was at the controls, actually, at Kitty Hawk. And I told my students you know, that uh, these two guys didn't have the benefit of the education that you give your students and that we give our students at Lehigh. Uh, they were bicycle mechanics. They were all really self-taught. Uh, yet they knew enough to build a wind tunnel, and they uh, studied the shape of the airfoils on the Wright Flyer. The Wright Flyer is actually uh, in the museum down there in uh, Washington. You've probably seen it in the Air and Space Museum. Uh, 
Uh, and, uh, and they did a remarkable job um, getting uh, to the point where they could uh, become airborne uh, just for a few seconds at a time. But within a year or so, they were flying around for uh, like an hour at a time, uh, pretty much, uh, uh, in that era where it launched uh, the aerospace industry. Uh, it wasn't going real fast, and this is what, uh, uh, 30, 15 years later, <coughs> we're still flying a pretty much wooden uh, structure airplane with stringers. Uh, this is up with a camel. Snoopy and the Red Baron are uh, there. And, uh, but a real nice airplane. A lot of these are still maintained today. If you take good care of an airplane, you can fly them almost forever. Right? The airplane I own out of Allentown with uh, a couple other partners is 50 years old, Piper Navajo. Uh, and you can maintain them, they last uh, quite long. But uh, they used uh, a lot of composite materials, the original composite material uh, wood, and, uh, and that worked uh, real well. And still does work well today for uh, certain. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry to pick up the pace a little bit. We uh, got Charles Lindbergh focused on creating the airline industry. You know, he was really uh, working very hard uh, as a pioneer. Spirit of St. Louis took off out of Mitchell Field at Long Island, uh, flew across the Atlantic and landed in the middle of the night in Paris. <coughs> and Lindbergh was shocked at how many people were there. I guess the word spread that he was on the route. <coughs> and it made even a bigger splash than he thought it would at the time, but it really kind of began to show that we could start to use uh, airplanes as a, a viable trans transportation system. Uh, yeah, the PT-17, Boeing's first airplane, was a trainer, uh, kind of leading into the World War II time frame, and so a lot of these are still flying today, but still you know, fairly uh, old technology in the sense that uh, a lot of wood still in structure spars. Uh, fabric, you know, wrap these airplanes in fabric, uh, which is actually a pretty good way to get strength uh, out of uh, a structure. Uh, and uh, radial engines, as you can see. Uh, so they were pretty, uh, so a lot of these still fly today. It's one of the red and flies a lot. Uh, not, I flew on a rocket, but I don't think I want to do that. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe the young people here would like to do that sometime. But I'd rather be inside the airplane, flying it. Fully airbag airplane, it's a lot of fun. So the old technology is still very, uh, very much fun today. Uh, Amelia Earhart, for you ladies out there, she did a marvelous job of inspiring uh, her generation to do uh, bigger and better things. Uh, tragically, she, was, uh, she disappeared in uh, the Pacific somewhere, and uh, they think they maybe found some remnants of uh, the crash uh, more recently, but, uh, but she was a pioneer on the lady side. Okay, we got into World War II, and the technology pushed uh, very quickly then to go faster and higher. Uh, the state of the art at the end of the war of uh, 1945 was the P-51 Mustang that many of you might recognize. Uh, the engine from here was about 2,500 horsepower uh, uh, inline 12-cylinder engine uh, that was actually licensed by the British. It was the Spitfire engine, the Merlin engine that, that flew on the Spitfire fighter. Uh, and uh, they licensed it to James Packard, who uh, was a Lehigh graduate that started the Packard Automobile Company, and they built the engine renamed the Allison engine. The Allison division still exists today, I think it's part of Caterpillar Company. Uh, but uh, that was a Packard Lab, they're a big hot where I teach. Uh, so 2,500 horsepower, uh, air, uh, water cool, which is a little unusual, and a little air uh, intake here for the heat exchanger to keep that engine cool. Uh, you generally try to avoid that, I like to have air cooled engines more reliable. Uh, but to get the uh, frontal area done on this, uh, they, they went to a water cooled engine. Uh, got this airplane up to about 450 miles an hour. Now, right at that speed, uh, the tips of the engine's turn in like 3,000 RPM. That's a big prop, about an 8 foot, 10 foot diameter prop. The tips of that prop, if you calculate that, they're supersonic at that point. So you start to form shock waves on the propellers. So this airplane, uh, at the end of the war there, was, uh, you could put another 200 horsepower on it, you wouldn't get more than maybe three more miles an hour out of it, you know, because you're kind of starting to bump up against uh, sonic effects. Um, at those speeds. So uh, at that time, you know, the engineers, the aeronautic engineers, weren't sure whether it would ever be possible to go supersonic, uh, given what they were seeing uh, with this particular uh, design. Uh, so they started working right after the war uh, uh, with, uh, with NASA to begin to uh, do research on high speed. And the Bell X-1 was the first of the X-series uh, research vehicles. Uh, and it had a uh, uh, ammonia, um, a liquid oxygen engine, uh, rocket engine, to produce enough thrust to get this thing going. And they, they worked hard to get it supersonic. It took quite a few flights. Chuck Yeager, uh, famous, uh, he's still alive today. I think he's 90, 
three or four or something. Um, uh, it was the first uh, human then to fly faster than the speed of sound. And they eventually got this up to 1.3 mile. So it was pretty shaky. And I, and I asked my students, or I told my students, I said, when you were uh, a young toddler, when you were four years old, or you young man, how old are you now? Nine. I'm sorry, how old are you? I'm nine. I, if I asked you to draw on a piece of paper a really fast airplane, would you draw something like that? Probably not. No, you would, you would do what? You would draw like sweat wings and a sharp needle nose. You would make it like really slick, right? No, you wouldn't do that? <laughs> 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 okay, well, yeah, the, uh, the point is that you know, aeronautical engineers in 1945 didn't know intuitively what uh, uh, most young people know today, that, that if you want to, you may need to make sweat wings, and you have to make them real thin. And uh, so there's a lot of lessons being learned. And so all that momentum coming out of World War II continued for the next decade or so. And some amazing engineering was done in that time frame. Uh, so we got the 1.3 Mach of that. Uh, you know, like a decade later, uh, the uh, famous engineer of Lockheed Skunk Works, a guy named Kelly Johnson, uh, who ran the Skunk Works out in uh, 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 California, uh, Burbank, California uh, Airport, in a hangar, uh, developed a number of uh, super secret airplanes. But one of the ones he, he did was uh, this F-104, which was an Air Force uh, interceptor uh, with sustained Mach uh, Mach 2 flight. So in you know, 10 years we went from barely breaking the sound barrier to sustained flight in Mach 2. Because we knew to keep the wings real thin and narrow and the fuselage skinny and all that kind of stuff. We understood shock waves now and uh, high speed aerodynamics. So with a J57 engine and an afterburner, uh, this would go Mach 2, but not, not for very long. That, you know, this mission was to go out and intercept a you know, Russian bomber coming in or whatever and then come back and land so it didn't have to stay up very long. But at, at Mach 2, it only had about uh, 30 minutes of flight time. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but technologically, it was a major breakthrough. And we used these at NASA for astronaut training, and actually some of the first uh, pilots that got their astronaut wings, you have to hit 50 nautical miles above the Earth, uh, did it in this airplane. You could get up that high in this airplane. Engine would flame out, but you restart it. It's an amazing <laughs> yeah, I'll talk more about Kelly Johnson later. He was an amazing engineer. That same engine, actually, the J-57, Pratt & Whitney, uh, commercialized that and put it on the Boeing 707, the first international uh, intercontinental uh, air transport jet. Uh, it really revolutionized. Now, for the first first time the, in, the, in the history of the world, you could get anywhere in the world in one day. So it was a big deal back in the 1950s. We, don't, we take it for granted now, but you know, before that, you would know, go on prop airplanes, it would take you, you know, three days to uh, get halfway around the world. Now you could uh, do anywhere in the world in one day. Uh, taking advantage of the jet engine and high altitude and uh, so forth. That really launched that whole industry. That, that first 707 is at the Smithsonian, uh, it's the double jet. Uh, all right, the space program began in 1957. I was a young lad growing up in, uh, in Pittsburgh, and I remember going out one October evening in our front yard with all the neighbors. We watched Sputnik come over right after sunset, so the sun was still shining on the satellite. It was tumbling, so it was kind of blinking. And we were, uh, I remember all the neighbors were like terrified. They thought the Russians had taken control of outer space and we were all going to be their minions, you know. So it served a good purposes and stimulated a lot of good uh, interest in science and technology uh, in my generation and a lot of good teachers to, to make it happen. Uh, but the Russians uh, had launched out of the size of a basketball there. You know, we launched uh, just about a month later on a, uh, 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 a Vanguard rocket, a Navy rocket, uh, the first uh, U.S satellite to explore. And the race was on to get a person in space. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower was president, uh, created NASA that year, and then hired the first uh, astronauts. And they're all gone now, except for John Glenn, who's still alive, uh, former Senator Glenn, uh, and the rest have all passed on now. But they were the original seven astronauts, and they all flew at least uh, one mission in space each. Uh, so we're on a race with the Russians. Uh, we weren't doing too well. <laughs> and uh, and our, our, our failures were all on live TV at the time. You know, and, uh, so it was a little embarrassing. It was about 50-50. About half our rockets were working, and the other half were this kind of uh, happening. This thing had a uh, control problem, and it, instead of going straight up, it kind of went sideways, hit the tower. The tanks on the, um, uh, on the Atlas rocket are uh, kind of like uh, comparing to balloons. Uh, they, uh, in fact, the rocket, before you fuel it, you have to keep the tank pressurized with nitrogen. Uh, if you took the pressure off the tank, the whole rocket would collapse. <laughs> that was the structural component of the rocket. So when the thing went sideways, it hit the, hit the uh, launch tower there, it ruptured the tank, and the uh, 
fuel all blew up here. So you know, again, it's about 50-50. Uh, the Russians were showing their rockets the successes. They weren't showing the failures. They had some failures too, but they were doing pretty well. And really, the competition was really uh, U.S. versus Russia, but it was really uh, Germans versus Germans because the, at the time the U.S. team was Warner von Braun, the famous <laughs> Warner von Braun. Uh, he took about one third, third of the Pina Monday rockets uh, from Germany at the end of the war and went, got out to the west. Uh, the other two thirds uh, were taken by the Soviets and went to Russia. So those two teams were competing, and Von Braun was in Huntsville, uh, Alabama, uh, trying to build this rocket and a few others. So we weren't doing too good. Uh, we finally got one little rocket, little pipsqueak rocket, the Redstone, going. Uh, not a very big rocket, but we could put a single man capsule, a Mercury capsule, on there. Uh, and it didn't have enough, um, enough power to reach orbital velocity. Uh, so it was just going to be a suborbital flight, you know, maybe 20 minutes of weightlessness, then recovering in the Atlantic Ocean off of Cape Canaveral. Uh, so we're getting ready to do that. And there's a struggle going on. In fact, even when I was there, it was going on. The doctors at NASA are very concerned with the, the medical doctors. And they kind of don't want the astronauts doing anything. And the astronauts say, well, we can take care of anything. Don't worry about the doctors. So that struggle was uh, going on at the time. And there was this discussion about weightlessness. And of course, most of the the astronauts were fighter pilots, and they knew what it was to be weightless for a few seconds and to be maneuvering and all that kind of stuff. They weren't worried about it at all. The doctors were saying, well, we think you could breathe, but we're not sure you're going to be able to swallow. And you have to eat. If you have to eat something or drink something, we're pretty sure you're going to choke to death. <laughs> so they got the NASA people all, uh, the uh, executives of NASA were all in a, in a tizzy about the risk associated with humans being weightless for any length of time. Uh, so that struggle was going on, and then the first American in space ended up being Ham <laughs> instead of an astronaut. And so well, we're going to send a monkey up, a uh, chimp, and, uh, and we're going to train him. a pretty smart chimp. He was four years old at the time. And uh, they trained him to listen on the radio. He would actually throw dummy switches on commands. He was smart enough to hear what you're telling him to do. And, uh, in fact, when I was there in training, the, the training people will always tell us when you were having trouble with something. Yeah, Ham could do that better than you're doing that. <laughs> So we had to that for, for six years when I was at NASA. But he was pretty, and he lived to be 23 years old. He survived the missions. They launched him in the Redstone. Uh, it was in January, I think, and then he uh, re-entered uh, the chute uh, plop. Everything was normal, came down. The capsule hit the ocean, and it, um, uh, the shock apparently shut the pressurization system down, you know, which wasn't life-threatening. But it also, he didn't have any air conditioning for about uh, an hour. It took for the Navy to get out there with the frogmen. It was about 140 degrees inside the capsule uh, from the sun bearing down on it uh, by the time. So the Navy frogman opened the hatch up and reached in to unstrap Ham and Ham bit him. <laughs> so that, that was only a casualty on a mission. The, the Navy frogman got a, a sore, sore hand. But, uh, but uh, ship, uh, he was our first American in space. And he, he had a nice life. Uh, with the 23. Um, OK, so we got ready now to launch our first American. And he was not American. <laughs> he was a Russian. <laughs> so Yuri Gagarin uh, launched on a Russian rocket. And not only did he uh, go into space, he ordered the Earth like three times before he re-entered. And it was an uh, outstandingly successful uh, mission. They recovered him uh, on land, uh, which is a feat in itself, uh, over Russia. And, and uh, he became a hero. Even today, if you go around the, the nations that were the Soviet Union, there's huge you know, statues of Gagarin. Tragically, he died, uh, I think in 68, and he died in a fighter plane. Uh, they, they, they wouldn't let him fly in space again. He was upset about that. But he had carte blanche when it came to uh, fighters. He could go pick up a fighter any time to fly. And one day, he took a fighter. He was out doing aerobatics and hit the ground and was killed. Uh, so he, kind of he was the first human in space. They weren't too far behind. It was just a couple months later, we launched uh, Al Shepard. But again, it was suborbital. It was only like a 20-minute flight. And Al became the first American in space. And we finally got that rocket working, uh, that uh, uh, Atlas rocket now was, had enough power. So uh, Air Force uh, ballistic missile, an you know, ICBM, uh, that was repurposed, of course, for NASA with the, with a module there. Uh, this can reach orbital velocity and um, sustain uh, orbit. So John Benn did three orbits around the Earth. He became the first uh, Air John there. And, uh, in fact, his, uh, I think it's the Liberty Bell. His capsules in the uh, Smithsonian there down in Washington. Uh, on the aviation side, there were some really interesting things going on. Uh, again, higher and faster was the Creed, and uh, the X-15 was developed uh, again rocket power uh, developed to uh, uh, 
test out hypersonic flight in an excess of Mach 5. Uh, and at those uh, speeds, the temperatures get pretty high from the, uh, the, the viscous uh, uh, forces and drag on the vehicle. Uh, and uh, it had to be uh, dropped from underneath the wing of a B-52 at high altitude, but it might be off. It would glide back to a landing on the lake bed there. So there were quite a few flights, I think about 200 uh, flights of the X-15. Uh, and now, again, a lot of astronauts got their wings uh, on this uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, they didn't get their wings. I, I, I misspoke earlier. They, didn't, uh, they did testing in the F-104. The F-104 never got up. It just got up to about 100,000 feet. You have to get to 50 nautical miles. Uh, but they did that in this airplane quite a few. Uh, the test pilots got their astronaut wings. And we learned a lot about high-speed research. Uh, airplane made almost entirely out of nickel, uh, Inconel, because at those speeds you need, uh, even titanium is not too good at that speed. Uh, Kelly Johnson was at it again. Uh, it's hard to believe today, but in 1962, <laughs> this airplane was flying. Uh, and it was flying in places where it was supposed to be flying, uh, like over China. And, uh, uh, and there are a lot of interesting stories uh, I can tell you later about uh, uh, how that happened and, and what was going on with the Chinese people that were trying to figure out what this thing was flying over top of them. Uh, but it was a spy plane, of course, uh, and it flew for uh, about uh, 30 years. Uh, and uh, there were over 2,000 missiles uh, shot at it, different places around the world, nothing ever hit it. It was, uh, still holds a speed record today at Mach uh, 3.2 and 90,000 feet. Um, and uh, that will probably stand forever, I guess, because we're not building uh, air breathing engines uh, that go that fast anymore. Uh, and then we finally took it out of service before uh, technology uh, caught it and someone shot it down. Uh, it, it was an amazing. Uh, uh, all, almost all titanium, so the big technical breakthrough here in building this thing was learning how to weld and machine titanium effectively uh, instead of aluminum. It's a very easy titanium, is very hard, and, uh, but they needed to do that. Uh, to go up to Mach 2 with aluminum, but in Mach 3 you need titanium. That's the temperature. It's an amazing airplane. You know, on the commercial side, uh, we worked on Mach 2, or the British and French were anyways. Uh, Boeing had a, a supersonic transport on the books at this time they were going to build. Uh, and then they saw the price of fuel going up and um, uh, decided to cancel that program. But the British and French went ahead as sort of a national flag, a technology flag demonstration. And it was pretty successful, technically. They stole the, even a $6,000 a ticket to fly from London to <coughs> New York. Uh, they still were able to make money because it, it super, at the speed you burn about four times more fuel per mile. <laughs> You know, so as the fuel got more and more expensive, the uh, airplane just couldn't be affordable. But for, in terms of technology, though, it was a great demonstration uh, for uh, after-burning engines and sustained speed at Mach uh, 2. So you, you fly uh, you know, three hours from New York to London instead of five or six. You know. uh, aren't too many people that, that two or three hours is worth several thousand dollars in the ticket price, so it, it wasn't economic. Uh, okay, back to the space program, the most amazing thing happened not too long after John Glenn had that flight. Uh, John Kennedy uh, stood up before Congress and the whole world and said, we're going to the moon. So uh, it was a pretty dr dramatic moment. Uh, those of you who are my age uh, or older probably, probably recall that, that time. Uh, and of course, it was just what NASA wanted to hear. It gave them the national resources that they needed to, to make it happen. Uh, it was supposed to be happening you know, before uh, the end of the decade, before 1970. So after Mercury was over, the first program then uh, to get us to the moon was Gemini. So just a little bit bigger capsule with two people in there. And a bigger rocket now because of the extra mass. We used the Air Force uh, Titan rocket uh, to, uh, to launch Gemini. Uh, and now we could do rendezvous and dockings and spacewalks, all the things that we knew needed to be done uh, and what we needed to learn how to do uh, before going to the moon. So Ed White was our first spacewalker. Uh, actually, the Russians uh, beat us again. This is about maybe a month or two before Ed White did the spacewalk. The Russians did the spacewalk and put that video uh, on TV. Uh, and they were clearly trying, they never said they were trying to go to the moon, but, they, but our intelligence community knows they were. In fact, they built three uh, really big rockets that were bigger than the Saturn V. They called the M1 rocket. It had 20, uh, 28 engines in the first stage. And they uh, built three of them, and all three failed uh, in the first stage. They couldn't get the propulsion system to stabilized, it was shaking itself apart. So they, uh, they gave up and the third one failed. And no one was killed, they were all unmanned uh, launches, but the, uh, when the third one failed in 1968, they abandoned their uh, moon program and they didn't have a vehicle to get to the moon. Meanwhile, Von Braun was you know, building the Saturn V, but, uh, <coughs> but we did the spacewalk, uh, rendezvous, docking, 
some of the missions were as long as two weeks. Mm -hmm. She imagine living in that little capsule for two weeks, you know, it was a real uh, 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 arduous affair, uh, but, uh, but they were very highly successful missions. Uh, now, uh, as I said, Bob Ron got to build his childhood dream rocket, the Saturn V, so a three-stage, uh, like a seven million pound rocket, and it had a little bit less than seven million pounds of thrust when they lit the engines up, it would just kind of sit there for a couple seconds before it burned down enough propellant to lift off. And, uh, and it would just kind of lumber off the pad. It was very dramatic. I never got to see one, but people would say for, for minutes, you know, the ground would shake, you know, all around the three miles of the launch pad. Tremendous power uh, as that first stage lifted off. Uh, liquid hydrogen and, uh, I'm sorry, liquid uh, oxygen with uh, kerosene. You know. Well, they, you know, the, the rocket scientists can't call it it's kerosene, right? They can't call it kerosene, so they call it rocket propellant one. Kerosene. So kerosene liquid oxygen. The second and third stage were a little bit higher liquid oxygen, a little higher performance. Um, so it was an amazing rocket. They, uh, I don't know how many they launched, it must have been 12 or 14 they they've launched over the years, and uh, they were all successful. Before we got a chance to put people in the, in the, on the first mission that we lost our first crew, uh, uh, Gus Grissom, who was one of the Mercury uh, astronauts, uh, and White, who did that first spacewalk, and Roger Chaffee, who's a, a, a rookie, uh, were killed in a uh, uh, practice countdown at Cape Canaveral. We're in the launch vehicle. Uh, one of the issues in, in space uh, to keep the structure as light as possible, we only pressurize that capsule at 3 psi. So 100% oxygen, 3 psi, that's what you're breathing right now in this room. You have 3 uh, psi partial pressure of oxygen, the rest is nitrogen. So, so that was good from a structural point of view. But now on the launch pad, when you pressurize it, it's really 18 psi, isn't it? It's a 15 that you have at sea level, plus three more that you're pressurizing the vehicle. So 18 psi of 100% uh, oxygen was a, was a bomb waiting to go off. And there's a, some, they never find out what, the sh what caused it, but a short circuit probably uh, started a fire within 30 seconds and they were killed. So it was a terrible setback for NASA. I was a uh, student in Lehigh when this happened, actually, I remember it very well. Uh, and NASA had a take two or three months just to figure whether they could go forward or not. And what they decided to do was start all over again with a, with a whole new design with a lot more safety factors on it for the uh, command module. Less than, this is remarkable, less than two years later, uh, so that was January, that was January, oh, there it is up there, January 67, uh, Christmas Eve, 1968, <coughs> Frank Warman, uh, on just the second Apollo mission, the first one was, uh, a launch into Earth orbit uh, of Apollo 7 just to test out the command module. Uh, NASA did the most bold, uh, made the most bold decision ever made that they would go to the moon with Apollo 8, 8 uh, only the second flight of the Apollo, the Apollo program at that point. Uh, the, the lunar lander wasn't ready, so they didn't have that, but the, the Saturn V launched the, the command module uh, to, uh, to the moon. They made three orbits around the moon on, uh, just happened to be uh, Christmas Eve. They were reading from uh, Genesis. Uh, about the Earth and the heavens, and it was very, very dramatic. So it was a moment I think uh, anyone that was alive at that time certainly remembers, but it really affected the whole world. Yeah, I think this this photograph, probably more than anything from the 20th century, changed the way people think, both uh, certainly environmentally. You know, we saw that we live on this little cube, blue cube floating through space, uh, but also politically. I think we, we all started to think that we need to start working together a little bit better, maybe. Although sometimes it seems like we're going backwards. Uh, 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 the trend, I think, has been a good one, uh, and the space program, I think, helped that along the way a little bit. Uh, it was really a, a remarkable affair, uh, that uh, Apollo 8 mission. Uh, then we uh, had six uh, missions land on the moon, so 12 astronauts walked there. This is my boss when I was at NASA. He was the head of the office, uh, John Young. And here he's about three feet off the surface of uh, the moon, because. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, GM over R squared, right? And you figure that out for the moon, it's about one sixth the gravity of Earth here. So, John, with that space, John's about my size, but with the space suit on, you weigh about 400 pounds um, on the Earth. So, you, uh, one sixth of that, you weigh like 70 pounds on, on, uh, on the moon, and you're able to jump, right? You've seen, you've all seen the videos of the astronauts kind of uh, bounding across the surface of the moon uh, because of low gravity. And we got so good at designing these uh, lunar landers. Uh, uh, Grumman on Long Island, that they could add this little lunar rover. The last three missions all took up rovers, so they were able to cover uh, quite a bit of geography on the moon, or landscape on the moon, I should say. And they brought back about a thousand pounds of moon rocks um, over the, all the missions. 
they won, they had uh, three Saturn Vs left. Uh, they decided to cancel uh, Apollo 18, 19, and 20. After Apollo 13, NASA was getting a little nervous that we were going to lose a crew in space, so they uh, had enough moon rocks, we had enough uh, science from um, that era, so they uh, shut those down. Those three rockets became static displays in Houston, Kennedy Space Center, and Huntsville. Uh, uh, you can walk and see them today. Uh, the other one they launched, uh, instead of the third stage, the Earth departure stage, they made that a laboratory and became Skyland. And that was a very uh, 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 wonderful uh, science program back there. It had two objectives, it studied the sun, because you know, once you're above the atmosphere, you can just hold a disk up in front of the sun and you have your uh, solar eclipse. You, you basically can study the corona uh, like in a way you can't from uh, through the atmosphere. Uh, and also the effects of weightlessness on people. So the, there was a, uh, an astronauts went up uh, three missions, one, two, and three months each. We learned a lot about how our bodies behave with weightlessness and studied the Earth, uh, those outer part of the Earth and the sun. We finished the uh, Apollo program then with a joint mission with the Russians. We, launched and, uh, and we docked with their Soyuz capsule. They're still flying this today. It's been upgraded a little bit, but uh, the Russians are very steady in their uh, uh, use of technology, and they don't change stuff as much as we do, and they have a pretty reliable system now uh, with the Soyuz rocket and the Soyuz capsule. Uh, so uh, General Stafford, Tom Stafford, uh, docked, and then they exchanged uh, presents and drank some vodka, and then came home, I think. <laughs> so it was the end of the, the kind of handshake at the end of the space race. Uh, we started a shuttle program about that time. In the early 70s, we began to design, and the idea was to be reusable. So we had solid rockets that would return on parachutes into the ocean. Uh, and the orbiter, of course, would come back and land. And a big tank that was pretty much just a big, dumb aluminum tank that would re-enter the atmosphere, uh, the least expensive of all the components there. So that was the plan. And uh, the first launch was in 1981. My mission was a couple of years later, and uh, I've got some footage from uh, from the Dream is Alive. In the mouse, oh there it is. Oh, there we go. It's funny I can ask me the Dream is Alive. When these engines go about, what's the nose go about three feet this way from the from the torque where we stand? And when it comes back, then the solar rockets go. See, lean forward, and that comes back. Then the solar rockets land. When the solar rockets land, it kind of pins you against your seat. Because you go, all of a sudden you go from 1G to 3G. Second, so about Mach 6 there. And uh, if you put your hand out the window and feel what we call the Q, uh, the dynamic pressure, it be like, uh, would feel like 35 miles an hour because <laughs> the air is so thin. Uh, so you're growing very, very high, now, but going nowhere near fast enough yet to stay in orbit. Um, this mouse not there. This is kind of what zero G looks like. It takes it two or three days to get it used. That's me there. We're having a little meal session here. There are five of us on the flight. Most of the food's uh, dehydrated. We just uh, rehydrate it. You can even have little shrimp cocktails and all kinds of food. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of fun. Um, but what the thing happens, the food doesn't taste very good because you're, uh, you know, like when you have a head cold, your head gets puffy, you can't taste anything because of the swollen. If something happens in space, all the fluids come up to your head. So you get real puffy, and you look at the astronauts' faces, especially the first couple of days they're in space, and they all look real puffy. 
and that, that shuts down your taste buds. You know, so you, uh, when you eat the food on the ground, you think it's too spicy, you get up in space, it doesn't taste much at all. Uh, so you go around in lower orbit, you're going around uh, every uh, few years, Newton's laws and calculate. Oops, you go, you're going around about every 90 minutes. There we go. So you get two uh, sunrises and sunset every 90 minutes. This is the limb of the Earth. This is sun starting to come up. Um, we shot that for the IMAX people. You can see how thin our atmosphere is. There's really not a whole lot there. satellite, the first part of our mission was to deploy long duration exposure facility. So uh, about as big as a school bus, it uh, weighed 32,000 pounds. Uh, and there were uh, uh, 85 trays on here. So each of these trays is, is buckled down. And each one's a different experiment. There are 150 scientists around the world looking at cosmic rays, looking for meteorites, all kinds of things to study how things weather in space so we could design the space station ultimately with materials that would last uh, a long time. So we had to deploy that first. So uh, I deployed it uh, using the shuttle's mechanical arm. Here at Rotary Gulf of Mexico here, there's <coughs> Cape Canaveral, west of Florida. So we're going west to east there. And here's what it, what it looked like. You don't know what black is until you see space. You only see the stars because your eyes are so constricted from the sunlight. stayed up for six years, actually, and then one of my uh, classmates, Bonnie Dunbar, uh, captured it with the arm and brought it back. And there was a, you know, a lot of the foils and stuff were basically falling off. They were uh, so weathered, you know, from the effects of space, and mostly monotonic oxygen up at that altitude that's you know, highly reactive uh, when it hits the materials. So we've learned a lot, though, in the space station's design with materials that, that don't need a whole lot of maintenance. The other part of our mission uh, was to do the first uh, rendezvous, uh, which was my job with my commander, uh, and the first repair of a satellite. So this satellite was launched on an unmanned rocket in 1980, a Delta rocket, uh, designed by the Goddard Space Flight Center to study the sun, the solar maximum. So you, you, a lot of you uh, have astronomy backgrounds know the sun goes through like an 11 year cycle. So this thing was launched in 1980 to catch that solar max, which was I think in 81 or 82. <clears throat> and uh, study it. But unfortunately, it, the attitude control module right here actually, it, 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 there was a temperature uh, design problem. It got too hot and actually uh, literally bl blew fuses uh, and it was spinning out of control. Uh, so they couldn't use it for science for about four years. And we got the shuttle ready and we trained for about two years on how to get it, uh, get the, do the rendezvous and get it on board. So the, the primary plan was for one of our crewmates, George Nelson, to fly over with the man maneuver unit. This is a picture of him trying to dock to the satellite. And once he stopped the spinning of the satellite, then, then I would grab it with a mechanical arm and we birthed it. So that was the plan, but uh, things don't always work out the way you, you hope. And um, what happened was, uh, I'll show you the video here in a second, but uh, he had a, a malfunction of the docking adapter. There was an interference that they didn't see when they designed it. So he hit the satellite, and uh, when he hit it, he just bounced right off. It was a pure elastic collision with the satellite. And he did that three times. So now the satellite was like tumbling end over end. So, so there was a backup plan that I was going to just grab it with the, uh, the, the pin I had to grab was right underneath the solar array here. Uh, but now the satellite was tumbling end over end, so I tried several times to grab it, and each time it ran out of reach for the arm. So we had to back away. Uh, and then the, uh, we'll see the rest of the, the video, but the Goddard Space Flight Center fortunately got the thing back under control and in a slow spin uh, in this plane. So now it's spinning in this direction. And then I got up, up close to it and I was able to, to uh, grapple it the next day or two days later. So it was a little bit of a drama for uh, NASA at the time. So, um, and then, then we did the repair, so. It will call upon all the skills of Commander Von Krippen to bring the orbiter within arm's reach of the wobbling satellite. 
and on T.J. Hart to try to grab him. I thought my mother was going to have a heart attack with the water clump. I missed my heart. We put it on video. Spacecraft's going to be entirely in the dark. 
uh, with almost no uh, temperature on the seventh layer of this thing on that side. And of course, on the other side, you just have deep space, which is three degrees Kelvin, right? So uh, very, very cold, which is what they want to keep these mirrors and all the instruments uh, very, very cold. Uh, and, and more importantly, at a very constant temperature, uh, they'll be able to image uh, uh, right back to the Big Bang, they think, they'll go back to 50 years, and the infrared band. So it's a different band than uh, Hubble's mostly vis uh, visible, visible infrared. Uh, but it's going to be amazing when they get it up. They'll be looking at it. some very, very old uh, galaxies uh, that were first formed after the Big Bang. So it's going to be interesting. Uh, scheduled launch, I think, in late 2018 on a French rocket, the Ariane 5. So I hope it works, because if, uh, um, if it uh, gets out there and it doesn't work, like Hubble didn't initially, uh, we can't fix it. It's too far away to get people out there uh, without a major program, of course, to do that. The cheaper to build another one. Uh, so let's hope it works, and uh, <laughs> I think there'll be a lot of interesting imagery coming back uh, from that, that, that uh, satellite. Um, okay, um, so let's talk about the space station a little bit. Here's a typical uh, mission. Uh, we have one launched this morning. Uh, SpaceX launched out of Cape Canaveral, unmanned rocket, re resupply mission. So this is how we do rendezvous. Uh, the space station's in about a 60 degree inclination to the equator. Uh, so you got to kind of wait till the Earth gets spun around so your launch site's in the plane uh, and then you launch. So, uh, so here we launch and then by the time the space shuttle uh, reaches orbital velocity it's probably about 3,000 miles behind the space station but in the lower orbit so over, over uh, three days you catch up and, and rendezvous with the space station. Uh, this is what it was back in 1998, about half constructed. Uh, Russian uh, Soyuz is always docked to it. Uh, the lifeboat in case there's a depressurization or a fire they can, uh, Come home in that. Uh, a lot of solar arrays. This is over uh, Florida. Here's the Keys. There's Cape Canaveral right there, Lake Okeechobee. And almost any astronaut will tell you the most beautiful part of the world from space are the Bahama Islands. Uh, the Gulf Stream coming up here. This picture doesn't do justice to the, the depth and the blues and the greens uh, from the Bahamas. Uh, so we had a lot of pictures of the space station taken from the shuttle. And finally, on the very last mission of the shuttle to the space station, the second last mission of the program, Endeavour docked. Uh, and the Russians took the Soyuz, uh, undocked it, and flew around the space station just for the purpose of getting a picture of the space shuttle docked in the space station. Uh, but this is, about, this is like a football field here. This is uh, probably 100 meter, uh, and a quarter million uh, watts of uh, electrical power generated by those solar arrays. So a lot of power available for laboratory uh, purposes uh, on the space station. And um, it's uh, funded through 2020, and I hope they, they keep it going beyond that. Many, uh, it's mostly U.S. and Russian, but it, there are uh, you know, another eight or ten nations that help um, support it financially and with crews. And sadly, we lost uh, two crews in the space shuttle program. Uh, a lot of my friends, in fact, Dick Scobie was my pilot on my mission, was killed in the, in the Challenger. And the school teacher, of course, uh, particularly tragic with Krista McAuliffe on there. Uh, and it's a case where it, it, it's the, the nature of aerospace business and engineering. It, it's very hard to be vigilant all the time. And NASA took their eye off the ball and pressed a little too hard this one morning when it was a little too cold. And we lost Challenger. Uh, you know, in 2003, we lost at Columbia. Uh, a little more subtle, but again, it was they knew they were having an ice problems on the tank before launch. And they overlooked a big piece of ice that came off during launch and put a hole in the wing. Didn't realize the hole was there when they re-entered and uh, lost that vehicle. So yeah, tragically, uh, those two missions failed. Uh, uh, 136 uh, missions total uh, in the program. The last one was uh, uh, July of 2011. Then we shut the program down and uh, started working on the next generation, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, of course, NASA does some interesting unmanned things, too. Uh, one of the more recent missions was to Mars, Curiosity. And when I heard about this, I said, boy, I hope they're building two of those, because I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> you stop thinking about what they're doing. I mean, you you got you to get from Earth to Mars, and it takes about nine months, and you've got to target it just right. Uh, and you're trying to land on it, and Mars is spinning, too. It goes around once a day, kind of spin. And you've got to hit a certain target on the surface of Mars, and all the mid-course corrections and all the adjustments. And that's hard enough. But you get there now, we're going to enter a marsh, um, uh, Martian atmosphere, which is only about 1% of the Earth's uh, density. Uh, and they're going to come in and do some uh, aero braking to slow down a little bit, uh, pop a parachute out, slow down a little bit more, 
uh, then uh, the heat shield comes off, parachute lines down, they start uh, doing a uh, sonic uh, probing for the height to the surface, height above the surface. Then they lower the, uh, uh, they come off the backpack then and, and the light up thrusters, now they're going to start to hover and then lower on a rope, uh, lower down the, the rover on a rope while the thing is hovering about uh, five meters above the surface, uh, cut the rope and then fly over and crash. <laughs> I said, boy, that's a, like I said, I hope it will too. But it didn't work. <laughs> uh, it's uh, amazing. Uh, and and, and uh, trying to choreograph the, uh, the, 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 choreograph the whole thing, they also, also got the Mars Observer Satellite right overhead during the reentry. They timed that to get it in the right orbit. So it was looking down uh, on top of all this. But here's the heat shield coming off, you know, taken from the, the main uh, uh, spacecraft picture. And then the Mars uh, observer took this picture of the thing on the parachute descending down, um, and then the, uh, and the uh, where the heat shield hit the surface and so forth. You could see all that in this imagery. And then I came over in the next pass and saw the uh, where the Curiosity landed. You could see the rocket blast when it was hovering. Uh, and then after it cut the cord, it flew over here and crashed. And then uh, this was the parachute, the back shell, and the heat shield over here. So they were able to put all that together. And they missed their target, though. They, they missed terribly. They were trying to they hit this spot right here, and they missed it by one and a half kilometers or so <laughs> after nine months. Of, uh, uh, so it's pretty remarkable. Uh, they, uh, that's the three sigma ellipse, and they're well inside that. So they take the flat spot, of course, to land. Uh, but they wanted to be fairly close to this mountain, Mount Sharp. Uh, it's a pretty dramatic uh, mountain, and they think it has uh, sedimentary rocks. So if you're, you know, kind of a scientist that wants to look for life on other uh, planets, you say, well, you know, this had been a lake bed there, I'm pretty sure, at one time. Uh, and if there were anything living in those lakes and seas at that time, there may be fossils in the sedimentary rocks. You know, so the idea is to get the Mount Shark. And they're getting pretty close. It's been a couple of years now, but they're getting pretty close to Mount Shark. Right after they landed, you can see it there. That's, I think, it's maybe 10 kilometers away. Uh, but they're only they're moving just, you know, uh, uh, meters a day. Uh, and exploring as they go, you know, picking up rocks and doing uh, sample assessments. So we'll see what they find. I think uh, sometime uh, next year, I think they're due to get to Mount Sharp. Uh, we'll see what they find there. Uh, another more recent mission, uh, we launched a satellite find of Pluto, the, uh, the planet that is no more. I guess uh, poor Pluto got, uh, 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 I guess, busted in rank uh, from a planet to uh, uh, just another object in the solar system. Uh, but again, uh, almost any time we do one of these missions, there's lots of surprises. I don't know all the details about this, but when the scientists look at this, these pictures, they say, I, I never thought it looked like that, you know, and, uh, so we learn you know, about our solar system uh, on each of these missions. Um, so that's been one of the more recent. Um, you know, back on the commercial side, we take all that technology and we make it uh, uh, serve us here on Earth. Uh, communications allies, this is my last uh, job I had before I uh, uh, came to Lehigh to teach, and, uh, design and build and operate these satellites and lease the capacity out to the TV networks, which is Telstar 5. Uh, so uh, all that technology came from the space program. And then on the aviation side, we're uh, inventing uh, all kinds of new uh, aircraft designs. Uh, one of the most dramatic uh, developments more recently is the 787. Uh, almost 50% composite materials by weight. Very quiet. And uh, big windows, and nice and roomy inside. It's a wonderful airplane. Uh, very high performance, uh, uh, high efficiency engines uh, now in quiet. So it's designed to go into you know, airports like Allentown or others where there's a lot of uh, people living around uh, in a quiet and efficient way, uh, aerodynamically very efficient. So I think it's a good big home run for, for Boeing. On the military side, we're in the fifth generation of fighters now. The stuff I flew, uh, all, it's all in museums now, the <laughs> third generation fighters. Uh, but this Raptor is a particularly effective uh, airplane, very stealthy. Uh, the engines actually have thrust vectoring, so it can fly down to very low air speeds to zero air speed and fly like a rocket. So they, uh, they really you know, have uh, a tremendous technology. More and more, though, as you know and have heard uh, with some controversy, we've been moving uh, uh, in the military more toward uh, unmanned uh, drones or uh, unmanned aerial vehicles like the Predator. Uh, very economic. These can stay up for about a uh, day and a half. Uh, they can be operated from a hangar in Nevada when they're flying over uh, halfway around the world. And they can hang uh, Hellfire missiles and stuff on them. 
uh, and the uh, CIA and the military you know, use these effectively to, to find bad guys. They're also being uh, used for uh, scientific and uh, commercial purposes uh, uh, to study uh, agricultural issues and forestry and that kind of stuff where you can put a, up the sensors and for long periods of time you can study uh, one, one particular area uh, of the earth. Uh, so they, they have a saying, uh, it's three D's, if, if it's dirty, uh, dull, or dangerous, you why send a person you know, build a drone? And our technology sucks that we can pretty effectively uh, do this without having a person there to uh, uh, first hand to operate. <clears throat> uh, back to the space program, so NASA decided when they when they made the decision to shut down the space shuttle program, uh, they were going to take two different paths going forward. Uh, one was for low Earth orbit, you know, read that, going back and forth to the space station. Uh, how are we going to service that? And they turned to two companies, uh, SpaceX, I've got several students working out there now in, in California, uh, 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 formed about 10 years ago by Elon Musk, the guy that's also doing a Tesla car, and he invented PayPal, you know, he's an amazing guy. Uh, but he started, he hired you know, some people from NASA and a bunch of young people and they worked real hard. They built this rocket, the Falcon 9, uh, which has been very effective. Uh, and then another company in uh, Chantilly, uh, Virginia, Orbital Sciences, and they launch out of Wallops Island uh, on the uh, Del Marco Peninsula. Uh, SpaceX launches out of Cape Canaveral. And both of them have uh, capsules that can take cargo up to the space station. So NASA hires them like a taxi service to go to the space station. In fact, here's the, uh, on the uh, uh, wall of silence, they got an on ramp to the space station. Uh, so this is a record of production. I think uh, they've done maybe four missions. SpaceX has done about 12 now, uh, counting the one this morning. Here's the uh, Dragon capsule for SpaceX. They even build their own engines, which is what surprised me the most. I mean, Lockheed Martin and, and Boeing build big rockets, but they go to, <coughs> to uh, Rocketdyne and other companies to build their engines. Uh, SpaceX built their own uh, uh, kerosene liquid oxygen engines. There's nine on the first stage, why they call it Falcon 9. And the same engine on the second stage uh, gets them into orbit. <coughs> it can carry up about uh, 10 tons, and it goes up to uh, uh, about within uh, 100 meters or so of the space station. Uh, and it just kind of sinks up with the space station and drifts in very slowly. And then the crew on board the space station uses the arm there to, to grab it and uh, complete the uh, docking. Uh, so they, uh, they just do that uh, 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 you're from uh, man control inside the space station. <clears throat> and once they have it docked, uh, they can empty the cargo out. So there's uh, uh, 10 metric tons uh, going up, and they can bring back 5 metric tons to the Earth. Uh, so like I said, they've done this about a dozen times now. It's been very successful, and it's lowering the cost of uh, getting access to lower Earth orbit. Uh, just recently, uh, NASA gave uh, SpaceX a green light and one other company in Boeing uh, uh, to uh, uh, send astronauts up in capsules. So SpaceX is going to take that same Dragon capsule. They can put seven astronauts in there. Now, there won't be much control, though. It's a very limited control in one small window. But uh, So it's not the space shuttle in terms of technology. But it should be fairly effective, uh, low cost, relatively low cost way of getting people back and forth. And more likely, they'll take up three astronauts and a bunch of supplies. So probably not, but they could fit seven uh, in there. <coughs> uh, comes back like Apollo on uh, three big parachutes. Uh, heat shield uh, lands in the, in the ocean. And they can uh, bring it back. And there was the first one that came back uh, several years ago. I guess they pretty well scorched up uh, from reentry, but that's all you know, cosmetic. They clean that up, refurbish the heat shield, and then the, the same capsule can fly uh, again. So we'll see a lot more of that in the future. OK, the other part of NASA's uh, mission, now that they got that low Earth orbit stuff uh, worked out with these two companies, uh, is to uh, go back to deep space now with a, uh, a new set of vehicles. Uh, so once the space launch system, they need to find a better name. Uh, NASA doesn't hire marketing people. <laughs> yeah, we have a Saturn rocket. You know, that's a real rocket. You know, the, the space launch system. I don't know that. So uh, in the Saturn V class, it's 365 feet tall. Uh, 7 million pounds of thrust, using a lot of space shuttle stuff. The solid rockets are just stretched versions of the space shuttle solid rockets. The first stage is kerosene and liquid oxygen. The second and third stage are uh, hydrogen, uh, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. Uh, so very high performance, uh, uh, more, more than the uh, Saturn V, even the first stage, even the first uh, vintage years. Uh, well, it's about comparable to Saturn V, so 70 metric tons to a lower orbit. <coughs> Uh, so this one could be crewed with the command log. Look at the module, men, called Orion. 
but you could uh, uh, get 70 tons to Earth orbit, or you could put the third stage on there uh, as part of that 70 tons and then have a deep space uh, mission. Uh, then we're going to upgrade the solid rockets to liquid rockets, so they'd be uh, uh, hyperbolic at first for 105 tons, then go cryogenic uh, for 130 tons uh, to low Earth orbit. So now you can build, so this is what you need to get to Mars. You need big vehicles like this. So we're, uh, and the first one's scheduled to fly, I think in late 2018 or maybe uh, 2019. <clears throat> uh, the capsule's being, uh, the rocket's being built by Boeing. Uh, the capsule's being built by Lockheed Martin on California, on, uh, Colorado. Uh, and it's like Apollo, except it's a little bit bigger, so that four people can fit in there instead of three like Apollo. Uh, <clears throat> and um, that's being tested right now. So what are we going to do with it? Well, uh, uh, our scientists, uh, uh, no one's particularly interested in going back to the moon. We think we've learned a lot. Uh, there's always something new to learn, but probably not worth the money uh, right now to go back to, uh, to the moon until we're interested in going back in a permanent way, maybe setting up a, uh, an outpost where we're living on the moon all the time. Uh, but until then, uh, what should we do? Well, um, the uh, scientific consensus is we want to get an asteroid. Because asteroids are kind of the pre material of the solar system. If we could understand them better, it would be a lot more interesting than moon rocks. Maybe even more interesting than Mars. Uh, so that, that's a, a big deal. Well, this is uh, the asteroid belt, as you know, between Mars and Jupiter. Well, that, that's pretty far out. I mean, uh, it takes nine months to get from the Earth to Mars. Uh, so it's a three-year mission to get to Mars and get back. So this is kind of out of the realm right now for a manned mission. Uh, but it turns out, Hollywood loves to make movies about these, but they're near near Earth objects. So here's the here's the Earth going around in this green orbit. So we go around once a year, of course, around the sun. There's Mercury, Venus, uh, Earth, and Mars. Uh, here's an example of two large asteroids. Uh, they have numbers associated with them. Uh, but they're in roughly one period, uh, one year periods, uh, pretty close to the Earth's orbit. So either one of these, we can do a mission and go up. Uh, rendezvous with one of these, these are like as big as the island of Manhattan, you know, big asteroids. We can go up and rendezvous with one of them, uh, dock to it, do a bunch of science, and get back in about five months. So we can do that with that rocket anytime now. We've got the technology to do that. So, so that's one thought. The other thought is, and, and, this, and this one's I think is prevailing in most of the thinking right now, is rather than do that manned mission uh, that far out, uh, we would do uh, a robotic mission to grab a smaller asteroid in these same kind of orbits, grab a smaller asteroid, grab onto it with a robotic spacecraft, and, and pull it back to the moon, uh, Lagrange 1 point, in other words, where the gravity balances between the Earth and the moon. Uh, so I think about 36,000 kilometers from the, uh, uh, from the uh, surface of the moon. And right there, you can orbit and, and keep it there. Uh, it's fairly stable. We'd be able to keep it there for a long time. Uh, and then we'd have a, a manned mission go visit it there. It's only a, a three-day flight instead of five months then to get there, or a week flight to get there and get back. Uh, so that's probably the, the thinking right now that's probably going to prevail. But sometime next year or two, they need to make a decision because the rocket's uh, getting ready. And uh, between that rocket uh, and the Orion capsule, uh, we can do that mission. We, we could go back to the moon uh, with that setup, but we can't go to Mars. Uh, it's just a matter of logistics. I mean, if you're going to go to Mars, you need to send a whole bunch of stuff there and park it in orbit around Mars, uh, get it there safely, and then you send the crew on a high-speed mission uh, to get there, and, uh, and you have your return spacecraft ready. And we can probably do that almost any time, too. If it's just a matter of going into Mars orbit and maybe uh, exploring the two moons of Mars, you know, we could do that pretty readily. Uh, the problem is when you go down to the surface of Mars, okay, so well, you know you're going down in a big gravity well, and uh, to try to get up out of that and back to the Earth, that requires a lot more uh, doing, uh, which was you know, demonstrated nicely in the movie last year, The Martian. Uh, a little bit, I guess it passed the red face test, but this is very, uh, it, it's hard, it's very hard if you go down to the surface. But yeah, someday we'll do it. Uh, you know, I'd like to see it, uh, it maybe a little further out than that, but, uh, but we're, we're built, we have all the pieces in place to do it, though. just a matter of making up our mind. So I asked my students, with, if all this happened in the last 100 years, you know, what's going to happen in the next 100 years? So, uh, it's going to be remarkable. Uh, so uh, I'll, uh, any uh, uh, questions I can answer or uh, any thoughts you have about all well, this last 100 years and what might happen in the next 100 years?
Yeah. Questions? Yeah. I'm curious about the capturing the asteroid mission. How long would it take to grab it and get it back to the L1 point? It's probably five months again. I mean, it's the same orbital mechanics. You're going to do a Hohmann transfer up to the whatever orbit it's in, then Hohmann transfer back. But it depends on which one they pick and what orbit it's in. But it'd be, it'd be less than a year. It'd be something like a five or six month mission, probably. Just a question do we do it with a robot or we do it with people? If you do it with people, then you're when the people come back, they got the samples you know, with them. If you do it robotically, then you still have to park it and then do another mission to get to it to bring it back. Yeah. What are they doing with the space station for that long? What kind of research are they doing over there that continues? Continue? Yeah, the the research uh, goes in one of three directions. Uh, you stop thinking what's unique about being in low Earth orbit. Uh, you can study the Earth. You know, so you've got a great platform for scientific instruments to study what's going on on the Earth. But you can do that without people, though, too. Obviously, you can, uh, lots of satellites operate on uh, man. Uh, you can study the heavens. You can go out and you do astronomy and stuff from, from, from space. And that's pretty good. Not as good as Hubble or, or Webb, but you can do those kind of things. And you can study uh, weightlessness and the effects on uh, both uh, human uh, physiology, but also on materials. So that's a, a big area. You know, for example, if I asked you as a, a, a brilliant physicist, you know, I want you to, to freeze water, but I want you to freeze oil and water in a suspension that's e evenly distributed. So that would be something that maybe would be of interest to somebody, okay? So you try to do that on the Earth, you, you really can't do that, because by the time you freeze the water, the oil is going to float to the surface. You know? But in weightlessness, you could mix it all up and then freeze it, and you would have a, 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 a substance that you couldn't you know, manufacture on, the Earth, on Earth. So NASA's been hoping, hoping for 30 years that there'd be some magic commercial application in weightlessness that would make space uh, access to space economically important. You know, so you go up there and manufacture some semiconductor, or we've tried medicines uh, uh, in weightlessness, all different kinds of things. And, and there's always a, a little edge to it that looks like it's promising, but it's never get, we never get over the hurdle of what it takes to get into space in terms of cost and safety preparations and time and all that. And how so, many people yeah. are there? Uh, there's usually like six on the space station or seven at a time. Uh, uh, usually two or three Russians and two you. or three Americans and then some from other <coughs> places. Yeah, we just brought back the first American in state almost a year, uh, Scott Kelly. Uh, and uh, in the past, our doctors have not allowed us to go more than three months. The Russians have had cosmonauts up for over a year in the past, but the doctors think it did. It's, it damages your long-range health uh, that, that long. They're, they're still studying it. So a lot of it's a physiology and stuff. So those are the different scientific areas. So there, yeah, there's, not, there's just nothing like that really grabs people yet, uh, uh, which is a little unfortunate you know, because it'd be nice to uh, to have a permanent facility up there where it was viable and we we're always doing you know, new things or maybe manufacturing in space. It'll happen someday. You mentioned it takes a couple days to get adjusted. Can you talk yeah. about some of those experiences? Yeah, you feel, I mean, you, you get all the stories from the, when you're training, all the people have gone, you tell you what their experiences and all that. But until you try it yourself, you, you, you just get flail the first day or so. You, you try to move too fast, and then you start moving your legs, and, you're, and you start getting inertial effects and gyroscopic effects, and then you bang into everything, you know, you, so you feel really awkward. I mean, the first you would think like putting your pants on in the morning would be easy. It's not easy. It's everything is hard. Uh, and then after a couple, three days, you start to get the hang of how to do it. And, and what you basically do is sort of like an underwater ballet. You just use your fingertips to control your body. You just let your legs be quiet. And you just kind of move yourself around by grabbing things and sort of like an underwater ballet kind of thing. And once you get the hang of it, you kind of get the rhythm uh, of the natural frequency of being your body and weightlessness. You, uh, you become very good at it then. And, and once, you, once you learn that, the next time you go up, you're, you're there right away. But the first time you go up, it takes about three days to figure it out. And it just seems like no amount of training on the ground gets people totally prepared for that. It, it takes everybody two or three days. Is it, so my understanding is some edge of SpaceX is to make this available to everybody. Is, is that going to be a detriment to you know people wanting to get up and they, they come back and say, oh, it's really not that great because it it takes you two days to get used to it. Yeah, that would be down. a problem if they try to commercialize it. You're going to want to go for a week. 
Uh, but after a week, though, you want to come back, though, too. Like, well, my mission was a week, and you know, it's like camping. You know, it's very exciting. You go camping, you take all the tools with you, you light up your butts and burners or whatever you're doing, and you cook your first meal, and it tastes great. And after about four or five days, you say, boy, I'd really like to take a shower right now. <laughs> you know, and, and that's the way it is in space. You know, after a week, you're really ready to come back. These people do long duration missions. It's really, uh, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's grueling. You really got to be physically and mentally prepared to live in space for that long. Period of time. Yeah. Sorry, one last question. They said, does it married couple there? Can they have a baby there? Could you have a baby? I, I don't think no, there's any. They could have a baby there in the space station? Yeah, I don't think there's any problem giving birth in space. You know, I haven't heard any people talk about it. They, they've done a lot of research with animals, with all different kinds of animals in the space station mammals and insects and everything. Everybody, they all adjust. So on our mission, we had a box with 3,000 bees in it, honeybees. And there was a control group on the ground. There was one queen in there. And the first two two days in space, they were like totally disorganized. They were buzzing all over the place. And we thought it was going to be a failure. By the third day, just like us, they settled down. And she got them all marching in the right direction. They built a honeycomb, which was the same shape as the honeycomb on the ground. So they, they adjusted. And, and we adjusted. Yes, sir. So when you went to, uh, you weren't the first that grabbed the spinning uh, satellite to repair. Uh, but that's a lot of angular momentum that you have big mass spinning, and you sent a sat an astronaut to grab that. Yeah. So, I mean, that's like grabbing a, a locomotion component by, right? Yeah. You have that inertia, rotational inertia. Yeah, we were worried about it. We, uh, I did uh, training, and uh, uh, the arm was built by the Canadians. And I, I spent a lot of time up in Toronto on their high fidelity simulator, which had bending uh, simulation in it, so it was very, very high fidelity. But the one in NASA used, used rigid elements, so it, it, it was a little more jerky. And, uh, but but I, I was able to, the satellite was spinning at uh, one degree per second um, uh, in, a, in one plane. So I, it was technically possible for me to grab it, and the energy at that uh, one degree per second was sufficient, uh, was, was not uh, excessive for the arm. The arm would be able to, to, uh, uh, to stop that energy without breaking. Somewhere around one and a half degrees per second is where I could no longer physically keep up with it. And at that point, they were also worried about the energy being too great. So, uh, so the plan was for Pinky to, to George Ellison to dock to it. So he started it tumbling in a, in a, around a different axis so I couldn't get it. And when they came back, they, they slowed it down to one degree per second. So I, I went in and grabbed it. And then after, after the mission, everyone said, well, why didn't we just do that in the first place? <laughs> well, the, the problem was that the NASA had built this man maneuvering unit and they wanted to use it, you know, so uh, uh, they wanted to demonstrate how they used it. So, so we all kind of knew that. It was okay, it was good to do that, but, you know, we had a backup plan. <coughs> the MMU, when you grab it, I was just going to stay with it. I mean, it took a lot of that little momentum. Yeah, if he was able to dock to it, the, the thrusters on the man maneuvering unit would stop it. So then I could just grab it without any rotation at all. That was the plan. But when he banged into it, though, especially when he banged into it three times, uh, the impulse that he generated started tumbling on a different axis, you know, so. uh, Which part was the scariest part, I guess, of the, uh, was there any part during the takeoff and all that stuff that was the scariest part of the uh, Launch, I mean, all, you always launch, launch. I mean, launch there's so much going on and your, your options are very limited on launch. We had a return to launch site abort uh, mechanism or uh, profile that we could have done on any of the missions if we lost an engine in the first four minutes. Unfortunately, we never had to do that because you would have to flip around uh, up in space, flip around backwards, and start thrusting uh -oh. to the west to get back to Cape Canaveral. <laughs> okay. So we're glad we never had to do one of those. Uh, but an early engine failure, would have, uh, a later engine failure, you could still limp in the orbit uh, and, um, uh, and just be in a lower, lower orbit. So, uh, so we always watched you know, launch you know, very, very closely. And, uh, and once you once your engine shut down, you're weightless. You're, you're kind of pretty much there, and then you sort of relax a little bit. In fact, it's interesting, we, you know, what you, after a couple days, you start to think you're in an airplane. You know, we're all pilots and, and used to flying by, you, like you take off out of Allentown, maybe you're flying to Chicago, so you say, oh, it goes Harrisburg, and a couple minutes later you see Pittsburgh, and then you're in Ohio, and so forth. It's the same thing in space, except the, the angle rates are the same. Uh, but you're watching, here comes uh, India, and there's the Himalayas, <laughs> here comes Australia, over here, you know, it's all kind of, you start to think, oh, I'm in an airplane, you, know, you start to think, it's interesting how your mind, yeah. Well, one of the most vulnerable times for a human is going to sleep and waking up. Mm, yeah. Can you describe what that was like? It's great. I mean, uh, the first day, <laughs> I, I was sick the first day, but 
about two out of three astronauts are sick uh, the first day. We uh, keep, kind of keep that quiet, but uh, only about one third uh, go up without any symptoms. And it's interesting, though, the one third that go up, a lot, a lot of them have had motion sickness on the ground, and they go up and they're fine. You know, I was a fighter pilot. I, I could do anything in an airplane, never get sick, and I went up and I was sick. You know, so it, huh. they, they can't figure it out. It has something to do with, uh, I think, brainstem kind of things. But, uh, but at any rate, so I, I went to sleep the first night, and I, and I kind of had an immediate nightmare that I was falling, and I was. <laughs> and I, went, I, I, grabbed, I actually ripped my sleeping bag. I, I grabbed so hard to try to reach something. And then I realized where I was, you know. I finally fell asleep. But, but after you get over that initial day or so of not feeling too good, then uh, it's the, like the ultimate waterbed, because you're, if you ever look at any of the other um, IMAX movies, uh, you see the crew sleeping, your, your hands come up here, and your legs come up like that, sort of a, in a fetal kind of position. It's very comfortable, you know, toss or turn at all. And yet, you know, usually you sleep about four hours in space, it's sort of the average. But it's a very deep sleep, it's a very restful, no, uh, no pressure on your body anywhere. And when you wake up, do you feel disoriented, I guess, or is it? A little bit. I remember the first day I, I woke up and, you know, I saw his hands in front of me. I <laughs> didn't my hands. You don't get tied down or anything while you're sleeping? You can't. You usually just take a lanyard. Uh, if you're on a mission, we all slept at the same time, but if you're hot bunking, as they say, then uh, there's little compartments where you close uh, uh, like a shutter, and then you're, you're inside a, a compartment, you put your, your uh, protectors on, and it's dark in there. But we just kind of floated around. You can usually put eye shades on, because when the sun comes in, it's like really bright. Uh, so, you, of course, you go around the earth every 90 minutes, and so you get sunrise, sunset, so you want to keep the uh, sun out of your eyes, so you wear eye shades. Yeah. Uh, you said that it was very dark, the, 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 the space was very dark, you couldn't see any stars, but is yeah. there any time where you see stars? In, no, it's ironic. The pictures on the moon, and it's all dark, so you, is it? Yeah, it's ironic. I mean, you can see the moon, but it's, uh, it's very ironic that you go up for a whole week in the space shuttle and you never see a star. So the problem is when you're in the Earth's sunlight, the sun coming off the shuttle's tiles are, are white, very brilliant, plus all the albedo coming off the Earth, a lot of uh, ambient light around. So your eyes constrict way down. And when you look out in the, in the space, you, your eyes are too constricted to see the stars. So it's just, it's almost as palpable. You feel like you could touch the blackness. It's just very black. Okay, so then you go through the Earth's shadow for right. 40 minutes. Uh, then you need to do work. So you got the lights are turned up uh, all the time. So when you go into the Earth's shadow, you can see what you're doing. So it's like being in an airplane. You generally don't see the stars outside because the lights are on inside the cabin. You know, so if you, if you turn the lights down at that point, you can see the stars, which we were all trained to do that if we had a realigned uh, platform. We use the star trackers, we had to recognize what the stars were pointing at. You know, but, uh, uh, but generally, you, 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 oh, but you, could, could, you could see them if they turn up all the lights. Yeah, at night, in, in the air shadow, for that 40 minutes, shadow. So if you turn the lights down, you, you can see them fine. Okay. You know, but, but generally, you, you need to have the lights up so you can see what you're doing inside. Yeah, we had to memorize. Uh, I don't, I don't think I remember even three or four of them anymore. We had to memorize 50 pairs, no, 25 pairs, 50 <coughs> stars that are roughly orthogonal, so we could uh, align the platform if it ever tumbled. Uh, so I had all these stars memorized when they were, but I, mean, I don't know if I could really find them or not, but uh, I don't think they ever had to do that. So. Yeah. Uh, did you stay long enough in space that when you come back, they actually noticed that you got taller? When, when you come back? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because you get you go through this three-day transition, and you, you, your your gains turn way down. So you use your body uh, muscles very lightly to move your body around. So you can think of it as a control system. Your gains are back way off. Then mm -hmm. you come back to Earth. You know, and even after a week or so, when you go to get up out of your chair, you feel like you're using almost all your strength to get up uh, out of your chair. Because you know? you're used to moving your body around with very light forces. And then, you know, if you ever saw the astronauts inside the <coughs> hatch before they came down the stairs, you'd see we'd all be in there doing uh, deep knee bends, trying to get our muscles working again so we wouldn't fall down the stairs on national TV. You know? So uh, you really feel heavy. And then uh, when you first come down and you're walking on the ground, when you go to turn, you start to tumble because uh, your your semicircular canals are oversensitized uh, from the weightlessness. So it's now back in gravity, you start to get uh, coupling in the semicircle canals, and you, you feel like you're tumbling. But after, uh, if you're up for a week, uh, all that goes away in about uh, a day or two. If you're up for uh, months, it might take weeks for it to go away. What about your height? You grow, you know, like I grew about an inch. Uh, 
but that, that doesn't last more than a day or so. Okay. It's just the, uh, the cartilage expand between your vertebrae. Back John, uh, how much time did you have to just look out the window? A fair amount, actually. We, uh, <laughs> we would, uh, they, uh, Houston would put us to bed at 8 o'clock or whatever, and they, uh, the, the deal was that uh, they wouldn't call us on the radio then unless there was something uh, that needed uh, important attention. So you'd have uh, eight hours anyways, uh, Houston not bugging you. Uh, and then uh, during that eight hours, you probably had to want to sleep maybe four. So you spend a lot of time. And, and it's good because uh, you see a different part of the world as the day goes by. Your orbit, of course, is inclined and uh, roughly inertial to the stars and the Earth's turning underneath you. So during those eight hours when you're sleeping, you can see the Himalayas and other stuff where, the, where the, during the daytime you might be seen in the United States and South America. So you get to see different parts of the world in the daylight. But again, the guys at the space station, after a couple of weeks, that gets old. <laughs> and it's really, uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, uh, almost grueling kind of experience to be up that long. Mm -hmm. How did you connect with NASA? Like, did they just want this there? Like you program, well, I, I applied. They, they were actually advertising in a, a military magazine. I was a fighter pilot on the weekends. You know, the engineer at Bell Labs at the time. So I had an interesting uh, intersection of uh, operational and, and engineering background. But even that, when I went through the selection, I didn't think they were going to pick me. I met all these high power people. <laughs> but they did uh, uh, pick me. I think largely because I was a Bell Labs guy. I didn't realize how much. Uh, uh, regard uh, NASA had for Bell Labs because uh, they did a lot of systems engineering during Apollo. Uh, so I, uh, unbeknownst to me, I, I kind of wrote in on the pigtails of Bell Laboratory. Yes, sir? Um, you're talking about the mission trying to get a sample from NASA. How do you connect something uh, that light in space, much less for a manned mission on it? Yeah, it's hard. It's not that easy. Uh, the, uh, the Europeans uh, and uh, Goddard both have a design. The Europeans used it on this Phyla spacecraft. That, yeah, I uh, it didn't much. Yeah, it didn't quite work right. Yeah, it, it's a harpoon. Right. They launch a harpoon into the, uh, and it anchors into the meteor like, uh, like a uh, piton would for a mountain climber. Uh, and then they can reel it in to, to pull it tight uh, and then do the tow or whatever you're going to do. Uh, other projects that are, uh, or other concepts have looked at some kind of net or something around it. So uh, but I think the harpoon is probably what they're going to use. They seem to work pretty well. I mean, they had a problem with Phyla that sort of bounced a little bit because the gravity was so low. They ended up tumbling. And when it tumbled, it got into shadow. So the batteries died after a couple of hours. But, uh, but the concept was probably the right one. <laughs> what kind of money they give to these people? Which people? Sally, the people who go in space. Astronauts like you, what you yeah, 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 I'm a civil servant employee. I think I was at GS uh, 15. I was probably making, uh, this is 1984, I was probably making $65,000, which is pretty good. So they would give you anything extra, just what you were making? Yeah. Why? Well, you get, you get uh, flight time. You get flight pay. <laughs> <laughs> they pay you by mile? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were one and a half million miles. <laughs> So somebody brought up money, so I want, I'd like to ask you about money, because there's that famous line in The Right Stuff where they, they, the screenwriters gave it to John Glenn, and no bucks, no bucks, ro no buck Rogers. Um, I, I vaguely recollect, and maybe you can correct me if my memory's wrong, but I think that in the, in the height of the space program in the 60s, I think I remember that 5% of government spending was Yep. Was to the space program. Just a little bit less, four and a half. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. So, so, I'm, so I'm, not, I'm not far That's off. That's the ballpark, yeah. My, my rough back in the envelope calculation now is that that would be about $200 billion <laughs> of yeah. government spending right. nowadays. Yeah. That would be about 5%. Yeah, we're way down. We're under Yeah, one. I was going to say. We're so under 1% so. now. Yeah. 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 And NASA's around $20 billion, I think, a year. But, but that only, uh, you know, less than half of that is space uh, exploration. Because uh, NASA does a lot of stuff in air, air, air and dynamics, air, right. uh, and, and aviation safety, and then basic science, you know, planetary science, and all. Yeah. So NASA, all, NASA's role has probably expanded. It has, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the space program, yeah. If you look at the the years um, of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, the 1960s, basically, uh, we spent about 25 billion dollars uh, to get to the moon and back uh, those missions, uh, which you know, seems pretty small by today's standards, you know. Uh, 
but during that same period of time uh, in our country, we spent more on dog food <laughs> than we did go to the moon. So it cost every every citizen about $125 during that 10-year period. So $12 a year for us to go to the moon for citizens. So uh, uh, the uh, economics are not bad. Unfortunately, NASA gets lumped in with the DOD budget, which is you know 100 times bigger than NASA's budget. You know, so they they end up having us uh, I'll be on the defensive in terms of arguing their budget uh, sometime. They're doing okay. I mean, they really didn't get, even in the 2008 and the economic decline, NASA kind of held fairly level. And as the space shuttle came out of service, they took all the money they were spending on the shuttle and then appropriated it to these two programs, you know, building the new rocket and then the SpaceX missions. Uh, so they, they've kind of held their own you know, pretty much both on the science side and on the uh, space uh, exploration side. Yep. Well, I know the shuttle was designed for just a 10 year lifetime and then it lasted 30 years. I know I knew it, what, 100 there? That's no, it was more than 10. The, the original program, uh, this was the mistake. This is what caused the Challenger accident. So they, uh, Nixon was president and they uh, uh, said, well, okay, what are we going to do now? The moon landings are over. Uh, NASA said, well, we want to build, we, we wanna, there's two things we want to do. We want to build a space station and we want to build a vehicle to get back and forth that's reusable. Okay, so there wasn't enough money to do both, so NASA said to the president, well, we want to do the space shuttle first, and then we'll use it to build the space station, which is ultimately what we did. Uh, okay, so they put the program together, and they said, we want this thing to fly, uh, to, to build up to 50 missions a year. Okay, and it was a 500 mission model over roughly 30 years, uh, and each orbiter was going to be good for 100 missions, and we're going to build five orbiters. Okay, so... The program started off, you know, and, and the first few flights went pretty well. So two, three years late getting started because of technical problems. But things were going pretty well. But all this pressure was starting to come on the NASA managers to get the flight rate up, to get the cost down, to meet this mission model, which was flawed, really. It was never, really never going to be possible to do that. They, they kind of oversold it to the Congress uh, as a cheap way to get the space. And the orbiter was just too complex to, to, to not do all the maintenance that you needed to do between missions. So that so as the, uh, the flight rate wasn't climbing fast enough, there was pressure to do that. So the morning we lost Challenger, the NASA guy that made the call from Marshall, the Space Flight Center where it's responsible for the solid rockets, uh, was told by the call engineers that the seals were too cold. And even as early as my mission, they had seen uh, some failure in the seals. I, I launched on April morning, it was pretty cold. When they brought those solid rockets back, there was uh, uh, a little blow-by in the seals, uh, but there's two layers, so I'm here today. <laughs> uh, but they, uh, they never told Houston about that. The people when this was one of the problems at NASA, they were very decentralized. So the decision-making was at the centers, and the centers didn't want to tell the other centers that they had problems. You know, they wanted to fix them and not tell them. So, that, so Houston never even knew about the seals until we lost Challenger. But that morning, the engineers were arguing against it. But this guy had so much pressure on him uh, that he said, we, we got to launch. The, the famous quote was, well, when are we going to launch in June? You know, uh, so they, you know, they, he, gave, he overrode the engineers and, and told Mission Control that they were go when they, they shouldn't have been. Um, so it was pretty gross. But then, then, you know, Columbia was a little more subtle again, but it was uh, another problem where they knew they had something going on and they just didn't pay enough attention to it. You know. So it's, it's a tough problem. But that mission model that they created uh, was the source of the problem, and that it was too ambitious. It was more than what was reasonable to try to do with the technology that we were you know, using. It, the, the big mistake was to build the shuttle so big. Uh, what they tried to do was all the cargo had to carry up uh, 65,000 pounds, uh, uh, plus a crew of seven. You know, that was the design parameters. Uh, and that, a lot of that was driven by the Air Force uh, uh, satellite. Uh, dimensions and, and masses. Uh, so they built this one big vehicle to do the whole thing. It was just too, they, they should have done, we should have launched big payloads on unmanned rockets and launched the crew on a smaller thing that was easier to maintain. And it would have been, uh, that's what we'll do someday. I think we'll, we'll get back to a shuttle in the future, but it'll be smaller just for the people to go back and forth. And then uh, we'll end up uh, putting uh, big cargo on big unmanned rockets. A hard lesson to learn, though, that the yeah. you know, combination of politics and maybe some bad engineering at the same time. Yeah? Um, with the four hours of sleep, is that because like you had such a good environment to sleep in, or was there some sort of biophysical? I, I think it's because you're weightless, your body just, uh, it's very deep sleep when you, when you do fall asleep, no tossing and turning at all. Mm -hmm. 
But it could also be, I mean, you know, I was on there for a week, so it, some of it's the excitement of being up. You know, if you're up for a long period of time and you start to get a little more bored, maybe you do sleep a little longer. So is that common among, like, astronauts? Yeah. Yeah, we all felt that four hours was enough. Hmm. Now, the long duration missions make that change. Another question? One more? How about the uh, Yeah, I mean, uh, what, what you, what you, the, the image you get from space is, uh, you know, we're all on this blue marble, you know, floating through space together. You know, so you really have a sense of the uh, importance of taking care of the planet, both environmentally and politically. I mean, really you come back with that view, and uh, and that's you know, pretty much universal among astronauts. We we have a society we all belong to. It's the ASE Society, Association of Space Explorers, those cosmonauts. Uh, astronauts mostly, but other countries too, that have all flown in missions. And, and we do things like that. We have an annual convention somewhere in the world, and, and kind of those are always the themes, you know, um, political uh, stability and, and take an environmental uh, sense. So yeah, I think um, when historians uh, 100 or 200 years from now look back on the 20th century and the space program, you know, they're going to they're gonna probably conclude that the best thing that came out of it was not necessarily the technology it'll be that sense of uh, the Earth uh, and the need to protect it uh, as we float through space, you know, take good care of our home here. You know. So I think I got a feeling that's going to be the, the real upshot of the space program. So, so. Well, thank you all very much, and uh, good luck.